So well, there is one question around cities is, which is how do we make them matter more? And what do we mean by that? Let me get my notes. Um, you know, we hear all the time that uh, they matter for the economy, they matter for regional economies, but how? But how do we make them matter more? How do we make them matter, matter more for businesses and entrepreneurs that are perceived as job creators? For example, by asking questions like, how do we make them matter more for creativity and idea formation and diffusion? For the translation of ideas into action? We know that great opportunities for innovation occur at the intersection of disciplines and industries. What do we do about that? How do they matter for the location decisions of companies? And how do, we, how do they matter for the entrepreneurial decisions of individuals? How do, cities, how do we make cities matter more for the entrepreneurs that do not make apps and the economy that already exists? Uh, the ones that, how do we bring new knowledge and new technology into existing businesses and areas like art, design, music, food? How do we make them matter more for legacy cities? and for uh, and neighborhoods. Uh, what can we do in the neighborhoods and the cities that have been hollowed out by industrial change and structural economic change? Um, for the cities themselves, how do we make cities matter for themselves, not just for the businesses that are within them? How can cities themselves leverage this wave of innovation to improve infrastructure, urban life? Um, for rural areas, uh, we have these cities that have become magnets, and I know Amy has a lot to say about this, uh, with so much focus on cities, what is happening to the non-cities out there? Uh, and finally, most importantly, how do, we, how do they matter for the citizens, uh, for civic engagement? Uh, how do we uh, increase democratic participation? How do we engage the citizens in the process of innovation-based economic development? And uh, how do we make them matter for opportunity and inclusion? How do we create urban growth policies that instead of displacing the middle class, the poor, and the less educated, are inclusive and really create opportunities for all? How do we embrace immigrants, and not just the highly skilled, but the ones that make the economy work behind the scenes? So there are really so many questions out there, uh, uh, many beyond this, uh, but uh, looking at what each of you here brings to, uh, to the table from social physics to manufacturing time to Detroit Future Cities to your experience past in the media and now as a civic leader in the city. Uh, please introduce yourselves. Uh, what it is that uh, you do, how this conversation relates to what you do, and uh, share with us some thoughts to begin with about these questions. Sure. Also, uh, uh, so my name is Kyle Polk. Um, I am a consultant to Detroit Future City and also a real estate development uh, firm. Um, my, my background is um, I started off uh, as an investment banker, uh, worked for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, a little, little more back there? OK. So um, and then had this amazing opportunity to work at an organization called the Initiative for Competitive uh, Inner City. Uh, with my then director, Teresa Lynch. Um, the focus of that work was around uh, basically identifying the assets of the city of Detroit, which was a, a very heavy lift, uh, in which the city itself hadn't done at the time. Um, and so it was, you know, it started off as an 18 month project, it wound up becoming four years, give or take. Um, and from that report, uh, a huge swath of information that uh, included every single industrial parcel of the city of Detroit, uh, the name of the employer, how many people they employ, what the level of education was, the access to freeways, the vacancy or the occupancy of buildings, um, became mapped. Uh, and so the, the value proposition for industrial assets in the city became much more clear in a place where it was basically unknown. So that process led to a list of strategies and recommendations in a book that's 357 pages now. It's called Detroit Future City. It's a great night, uh, nighttime reading. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, as, this, as we talk about this conversation of how to make uh, cities matter more, um, there's so many different ways to, to slice it. But what I'm really interested in about this, this panel is the fact that we're basically all in the, in the business of uh, making cities matter more, and specific, specifically our cities matter more. 
So there's a collaborative effort from the standpoint that we are all cities, um, but there's also a competitive aspect to, uh, from the fact that we want our city uh, to be better today than it is tomorrow, or tomorrow than it is today. So um, with that, I'll just pass it on. Okay. I'm Sandy Hedlund, um, uh, one of the people who helped put together the Media Lab uh, at MIT. Um, my most recent thing is looking at what data can do for development. Um, I just got corralled into uh, uh, advising the Secretary General of the UN on the, what's going to happen after the Millennium Development Goals, which are called the Sustainable Development Goals. <laughs> That's for 2030. Career planning. The sort of stuff that I look at is the sort of data that was never available before. So you talk about mapping all of Detroit, and that gives you insight into what was happening. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity for that. So some of the things that, that we've done recently is look at types of information uh, that you wouldn't normally think of. Like, for instance, cell towers you know how many people are in the area. So it's from all the how many people are in the area, and how many people are from outside this area, the home area versus outside. So you can get a measure of diversity in terms of communities just by looking at cell tower activity. And so you can now do things like you can go to every major city on Earth and measure what does diversity have to do with the growth of that city, and it's interesting. Um, if you look at things like GDP, our patent rate, uh, you can predict that from the mixing and diversity of the city without knowing uh, to a first order what continent it's on or anything about it. Um, you can do similar sorts of things you can predict crime. Not who's going to commit a crime, but is this an area that's going to likely have a lot of crime by looking at when you get big changes in diversity. And incidentally, you can begin to resolve some classic arguments. Like it's been argued that having a diverse population lowers crime. Other people argue that it raises crime. Uh, other people say, no, 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 it's the young people that are the ones that are doing all the crime. Uh, quantitatively, young people raise crime a little bit, but not like losing diversity. Losing diversity is two or three times as big in many, many cities. Um, and then, if you look at things like number of startups, number of patents, uh, growth in GDP, it turns out that that has to do with, quantitatively, uh, with the diversity of connections to other geographies that cities have. So is this a city that's just a Midwestern city, or is that Eastern Seaboard city, or does it contact the rest of the world? Again, this has to do with sort of diversity of ideas and people flowing through. And so I'm not saying that these are carved in stone, but we can begin to understand really the hard science underneath uh, what makes things good, what makes them innovative, and it comes down on the side of some of the things that people have always known, uh, but it says no to some of the other things that people have always known too, so that's what I do. It's so much fun to learn about your friends. <laughs> What they want and what they want to say about themselves. So I, many of you have probably been in a situation where somebody asked you to pick an animal that you thought reflected who you were at the moment. So I'm struggling here. So let's see what you think. I'm either a Neanderthal or a dinosaur. Now a dinosaur, I wouldn't mind being a dinosaur because they're beloved by children and they're these, these objects of affection and children have many of them in their bedrooms and they can do no bad. Neanderthals, on the other hand, I mean, have you ever heard of a child doll that was a Neanderthal? <laughs> I haven't, and I've never seen one. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my history, and you'll know why I'm wondering which one I am. So in 1986, I wrote a book with a couple of co-authors, Ann Markison and Peter Hall, called High Tech America. It was the first or second book that was written on the last great explosion of innovation in cities, starting it off in the mid-1980s where we were all running around trying to figure out why cities were dying on the one hand and rising on the other. The punchline was that there were places like Chicago and Detroit 
and Cleveland and Akron that actually had a base of industries that we could use an industrial identification code to say were innovative. So the, there were big chunks of employment in places that you might not have expected and were never considered high tech. But the rates of growth, which were what people were most attracted to, were out in the frontier in California and Arizona and Texas. The upshot of that is that there is always a base and there's always a frontier. And so you have to decide which one you are because that's what you're going to get to play with in terms of infrastructure. The next book I did was essentially on the same theme, but I did it for rural America. And what we found was that rural places around the perimeter of cities had the best chance of having a, a diversified industrial base. As you move to the hinterland, all the way out to the edges, what you found was true innovation. People that were in the middle of nowhere, and it didn't matter where they were because their ideas were so unique that there was no single location that they could be um, any made any better to be in. I met a guy that uh, ran a company building the turbine blades for turbines that broke. Well, turbines that break are losing $50,000 a day. So they will pay anything to get a turbine blade replaced. Turbine blade is really large, requires very specialized machines. So out in the middle of the cornfield, 50 miles from Cornell, there was a turbine blade manufacturer. Very innovative, very nuts as a firm because they ran like a, an emergency <coughs> room, which is not the best way to behave as a business. But all of that is to say, what's the, what's the lesson? So there are places where you're likely to find innovative industries next to other places where there is innovative industries but never discount the periphery, the extreme periphery, because it's, it's unpredictable. The third book I wrote on was looking at the service sector, because once high-tech industries began to sort of, you know, stutter a little bit and business cycles got in the way, we noticed that the economy was based on service sectors, jobs, and so the question was, do they look the same in urban and rural areas? Well, it was pretty much like the story of manufacturing, that is, around the rim of cities, you had relatively diverse services, and as you moved to the hinterland, you would end up with much more episodic types of uh, service development. But you had some basic ingredients that each community needed that had any chance of stability, much less growth. You had a public sector that was vibrant, you had schools, you had hospitals, and occasionally you had innovative activities that related often to the traditional economic base, whether it was agriculture, natural resources, or, some, or, or, or um, you know, low-wage manufacturing, actually. The next book I wrote was on the history of the world watch industry, which took 250 years to figure out why it was that one industry had gone all over the world and ups and downs over decades and centuries. Some people won and some people lost. Some of the lessons that I learned in looking at that book was how do places maintain their vibrancy? They did things like we're doing now, which is to have competitions and to recognize that there is a way that you can stimulate innovation. And on the other hand, there is always the pressure to revert to the norm. So how do you maintain? But the norm is important because the norm is the base. It's something, it's like what you stand on, right? But you don't, and you, and, but you want to leap off the base. So how do we do that? And so we're developing mechanisms, and I think this building is a, a really good example of that. So the last book I wrote is uh, An Atlas of Poverty in the United States. And that kind of brings me around to the end, which is this innovation economy that we're all really working hard to um, sustain and to make vibrancy obviously can't spread everywhere to everyone. And when we think about what's the innovative potential in the city, I would argue, and I think Detroit is a great story for that, when exclusivity, segregation, lack of opportunity leaves people out of the circle of opportunities, you will eventually find yourself in difficult circumstances. You can retrieve it, but you have to make sure you don't let it reach a very low level because the efforts to change are really hard. Thank you. Um, my name is Dan Coe. I'm Mayor of Walsh's Chief of Staff. Uh, before that, I was Chief of Staff to Ar Ariana Huffington at the Huffington Post. Um, so one of the things that I've never written a book, it's very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say, am I a Neanderthal? Or 
Um, but one of the things I feel like I've seen in the course of my role at Huffington Post um, and in my time with Mayor Walsh and previous to that Mayor Mino is that people fundamentally want to be a part of something. They fundamentally are social creatures and when you tap into that natural human desire to join in a community, unbelievable things can happen. So there's a lot of things, for example, that cities can do. There's a lot of things that an online newspaper can do. But when you really tap into that basic human instinct, that's where the magic happens. And so when I was at HuffPost, it's interesting, people think of HuffPost a lot for its uh, search engine optimization, its crazy headlines, its, its inappropriate headlines often. Um, but what really caused the traffic at HuffPost was not a good headline. It was a good story. It was something that people wanted to share with somebody else. That, that, that natural human instinct to want to share. When I see the potential of a city like Boston, one of the things that I feel like I've heard over and over again when I was growing up in Boston, uh, when I was away from Boston, now back here, is that it's a cool city, there's a lot of great ingredients, but there's not something that brings it all together. We have the best schools in the world, and people come from all over the world to learn uh, in Boston, but then a lot of them, the majority of them leave after that. Why? A lot of them say Boston's not cool enough. There isn't a good vibe in the city. Um, it's too old-fashioned. And in my mind, if we can create that sense of community that everyone wants to feel, if every day people get up in our city and realize that there are events for them to go to, to meet new people, to expand their bounds, that's where the limitless potential of Boston comes into play. That's why in Boston, we've tapped into a chief of arts and culture for the first time in 20 years. We put her in the cabinet, we've stolen her from Chicago, uh, so that she can really take all the ingredients of the art scene in the city and bring it all together. That's why we have Chloe Ryan here, who is the director of our One in Three initiative, to take all of the amazing things that young people are doing in Boston and bring them all together with different events, uh, advising uh, Chloe on different ways that we can tap into the young community here. That's why, quite frankly, we're trying to keep bar open, bars open later. Um, people laugh at the mayor, they say he's crazy, what's an what's ex-alcoholic doing trying to keep bars open later? The reality is, it's, it's about economic development. It really is, because at the end of the day, if you're an entrepreneur and you start a company at BC, MIT, Harvard, you may stay for five employees, ten employees, but at the end of the day, where do you want to be? You want to be in a place where there's a good social community and there's a vibe in the city. People go to New York, and of course because of the venture capital money, of course because of a number of other things. But at the end of the day, they also go to New York because it's more of a happening place later at night. It's a cool city to be in, so all the talent wants to be there. So at the end of the day, how can we make cities matter? More specifically, in my mind, how do we make Boston matter? There's a number of different factors that go into that equation, but in my mind, the more that we can tap into that basic human instinct of wanting to be a part of something and feeling it every single day, the more that we, at least I, in Boston, win. Thank you. <clears throat> so I, I want to take uh, a question that uh, that uh, Sandy you have in uh, your book. I uh, think there is a, there is a, I have it somewhere here, uh, one second. And uh, you know, in, in uh, and to touch on all of these different aspects of what uh, we, that each one of you have covered. And one is, uh, you have a question, is how social physics can help us design a human-centric society. So, um, how do we uh, think about First of all, what does this question make each of us think about? Well, how do we think about this particular issue? What does it mean in the context of uh, poverty, in the context of Detroit, in the context of retaining talent in a place like Boston? Can we go first? Good question. So the book's called Social Physics. <laughs> <laughs> um, just get out the Amazon. Um, the, 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 um, that comment came from a couple of thoughts and attitudes. So traditionally, uh, people were not very involved or empowered in society. Most people were not the decision makers. It was the king, it was the mayor. And you really didn't know why they were making these decisions. And so that's a lot of good ground for corruption, for you know small groups of people doing things behind your back. And it's not only disempowering, it's dispiriting. 
And if it's dispiriting, then you don't have the vibe that you're talking about. People say, why should I get out of that? Why should I help? What we're beginning to see now is we're beginning to see a place where it's potentially different. And there's a lot of dangers in here, but you know, suddenly there's a lot of data about things. So the mayor, for instance, has done a lot with you know very populous. That sounds trivial, but you can imagine lots of data about, you know, where are babies not getting enough food? And that that's something like a map on Google and it's updated every four hours. Or where are people getting what is the newest thing, something 68? You know, this new virus, right? You know, why you could begin making that stuff visible to people in pretty much real time. You can make it understandable if you put some care into it. And that's empowering. And it's empowering in the way that people can now have informed decisions that can talk about it. Um, and we could imagine redoing our governance mechanisms recognize the fact that people now would know something, that people could actually contribute. And it would be a very different type of society than we have today. Today we think of ourselves as having a democracy, but how often do you vote? And what's the diversity of the people you vote for? Well, they all have to go through these machines, right? So there's very limited things that they have to raise money. And, you know, can't we do a little better than that? One of the limiting things is information and knowledge, and that's changing. And that's that's like you know, back when books suddenly became available and people could read about other viewpoints. It's it's really potentially uh, you know a once in a species <laughs> event that you can see fundamental things about your environment and other people in a way that we've never been able before. So that's what I mean by human centric, is, is that you're empowering people with understanding of the situation and the voice to do something about it. Um, uh, what does this mean for Detroit? How, does, how do you translate these things to Detroit? I don't even understand the concept, really. <laughs> but um, social physics, as, as I'm digesting it, sounds like this the concept of open sourcing information about social change. Yeah. Um, I think it's. I think the idea of open sourcing in general is powerful, right? For the iterative process of learning and doing better, and doing it cheaper, and doing it faster. Um, Did you go out again? Okay. Um, so, so I think that concept is is great, and I think it has a huge applicability um, from a government standpoint, um, especially in communities like Detroit that are in the process of sort of wholesale upgrading the infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure around snow removal, the infrastructure around fixing potholes, the infrastructure around services as a function of you know, filing bankruptcy and, and getting your, your, your books uh, back in order. So I think it has huge applicability there. The, the idea of open sourcing as it relates to the entrepreneur in space, I think, is sort of a really interesting uh, opportunity that um, we should begin to explore. Um, I, was, I was in um, uh, crop circle there. Um, and everything around how Crop Circle is, run, first of all, a phenomenal organization if you guys haven't seen it, especially the, the Dorchester branch. But everything around how they're uh, reconfiguring space for the entrepreneur is not, a is not a function of a recipe, but it's a function of trial and error and quickly getting to the answer around uh, increasing margins. So, and that information is sort of posted, and everyone shares that information, and it's passed on to each entrepreneur. Um, and so that general concept, I think, as it relates to uh, the, uh, the open sourcing of ideas is really powerful. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, we're talking about sharing, we're talking about open sourcing, we're talking about some, what does this have to, what does this mean in the, everything you've learned in the presence you've studied and your current thoughts about who is driving the conversation around innovation and economic development, and how do we, you see, it, 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 of all the trends that are going on out there, which is the most exciting, which is the most troublesome? So I'd like to say something first about this Please. last question, which is that, um, I'm, so everybody probably knows what their product cycle is, right? So starts out, innovator, no work, no people working, it's just a great idea, and if it's successful, it makes market, and then eventually competition sets in and everything dies. 
And I'm trying to figure out whether or not, well, actually everything doesn't die. We have Procter & Gamble, so thanks for that, and many other large firms that still exist and still say, produce Colgate, toothpaste, and things like that. But I'm wondering whether we are in an era of technology um, push or demand pull, right? So we're, I'm thinking about, if you, so, so this leads into your question, which is, I'm thinking about a project that I just was exposed to. So I work on veterans' issues, and I'm concerned that we're working really hard to design things to try to help veterans get reintegrated into society and into the labor market and things like that. But we actually, when we design the tools, we don't have a board of veterans that we're talking about. <laughs> so a very fancy, beautiful new labor market tool was just developed. But when you look at who was involved in it, you don't see this mass of Marines and sailors and Air Force and Army folks who were consulted about what it meant. It was all these companies that were willfully giving up time and resources. And so for me, I'm always trying to figure out Who's asking for what? Whose opinion is shaping what's being done? And I think we're at a point where we can have much greater back and forth, but what I see a lot of is a one-sided conversation. So I see we were talking earlier about the whole movement of smart cities. And uh, it was a compelling idea that basically was picked up as, uh, with a bandwagon effect, and now every mayor, every city in the world wants to be one. I get Google alerts, and so I plugged it in and, uh, a while ago, and then all of a sudden, Modi, the new uh, president of India, uh, says, we're going to have smart cities, and there is no other message on the board anymore but smart cities in India. So how do we actually um, take the goodness out of the experience and the desire for social change and not have it become captive and lose its meaning to probably many of its intended audiences? That's one of the things that I care about. So, uh, Dan, I think this leads really well to uh, how does this, how is this, uh, what, what Amy just described operationalized in the city of Boston? I mean, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. I mean, I think, you know, us, politically every day we wake up and at least I, our, our team in the mayor's office wake up and read the Globe and the Herald. And if you look at the comments section, you'd think that we were doing a horrible job on anything that was being covered, right? Um, I, I, I think making sure that you are listening to an encompassing and wide sample of constituency um, when making a decision, or in our case, when we decide what we're doing at the mayor's office is really important. I think, you know, to the point of, um, you know, human information access and how this is a, a, a real sea change moment, I completely agree with that. I think the way Boston needs to approach it, though, is that we can't be with all due respect to people in this room, only listening to the people who are on Twitter or people who come to District Hall for policy guidance, right? Um, you know, keeping bars open late is very important, as I said, but there are a lot of people who don't even go out at night and who are more concerned about how they're going to send their kid uh, with a healthy meal to school every day in Boston. So one of the things that we need to really think about in this age of everyone or a lot of people have access to information in ways they never have before is making sure that there's at least some kind of baseline we think about of information access where we can confidently say that people who deserve, people who are online, uh, there is a wide sample of those people, meaning uh, up until even five years ago, and I'm only saying this because the data cycle that I looked at recently was in 2010 or something, a third of Boston residents still didn't have access to reliable internet. Um, you know, that is inconceivable to most people in this room. Um, you know, now virtually everybody has a smartphone, but there's a huge population in Boston that doesn't even have a phone. So to think about looking at Twitter for answers, to think about how we get people to go to Khan, the dream person that we, we've always heard <laughs> mythically but haven't heard in reality, the person who comes from a poor background, goes on Khan Academy, learns how to code, and starts Facebook. Um, we first we first need to make sure that people have access to the internet before they can do that, right? So uh, that's really important for us. It's an initiative that we were, we partnered with Google on for Boston Public Schools, um, and this year we rolled out 10,000 Chromebooks to Boston Public School students for kids who didn't have computers. Um, it just goes back to this: yes, it, we are in an incredible time where anybody can learn how to code for free uh, by getting access to. Uh, to the internet and getting access to YouTube or what have you, but uh, in, in our minds, it's really the role of us is to make sure that everyone is at a certain baseline so they can have those opportunities. Just say one thing. So, 
one of the things that, that we study is how people make decisions in social media, or in the presence of social media. And just generically, I'd have to say social media are bad. And the, and the reason is, is somewhat subtle. The reason is, while they can be very diverse, and you just pointed out that they're not all that diverse, um, you get hurting. So when you see an opinion that has a good headline, it gets picked up and copied and copied and copied. And you sit there and say, gosh, all these people think this, right? But really, it's just one cleverly titled person who got something on there and propagated it. So you get these, these cascades or waves of behavior that influence people. And as social animals, the basic nature of our species, we're very strongly influenced by the majority opinions. And it's very easy to generate false majorities on social media. And as a consequence, it's usually probably the loudest that here. And the loudest fairly, fairly <coughs> rarely have the best opinion. <laughs> and they're certainly not representative. And so, so along with the fact that everybody has to have access and want to do this, are these sort of bad dynamics that you get in a lot of these things. So there has to be some process to filter out and say, oh, well, there's a thousand people who believe this, but are they all just repeating one story? Or did they actually come to that opinion, you know, through their own experience? And, and if it's, you know, through their own experience, that counts as 10,000 opinions. But if they're repeating something that they read on Twitter, that had a clever sort of little jingle to it, right? That counts as one, <laughs> not 10,000. Before opening up to the audience for questions, um, you know, I think uh, going back to Amy, you, you have a historical approach to a lot of the work that you've done, and I think one of the advantages of looking at history in these questions is that we know that nothing is forever. Uh, no industry, no, no, nothing is forever really. Uh, well, that's a bit of adventures, but things are, they, we need to take care of them. So, can I want to ask each of you to reflect on this question, meaning uh, based on what each of you are doing uh, in your different contexts of what you've learned, how do we take care of what we have? Uh, I mean, Boston, for example, is a, is a very privileged city in the sense of having uh, uh, reinvented its economy numerous times. Um, and how do we... Uh, how do we just you know, keep it? And how do we prepare for the next wave when things might not necessarily be uh, the same? I think you know, Detroit is going through that process right now of rebuilding itself in, in many ways. Boston has gone through it in the past. We consider ourselves lucky, but nothing is forever. Uh, we know how towns uh, came and went with the watch industry. Um, and come from that. <laughs> um, I think it's the best time in a long time to be able to manage and cultivate what you want to be and how you want to be. Because this technology does give us a, an ability not to have to be right next to one another in order to share important thoughts and feelings. One of the things I no noticed in all the work I've done is that when places got in really difficult shape, it was usually because they hankered down and closed off flow. Um, there's always crises, right? And then everybody is shocked. But really, what happens is when all the information flow stops. My point in my last comment was, is it us pushing out, or are we drawing in? And I think it might be valuable to consider that because one of the things in every industry I've ever studied is, is when they got to be defensive and protective of what they have, which means they wanted to control the information the outside world had about them. The outside world found in a very sneaky way how to get in, steal the jewels from the crown, and go away and create a more subtle environment for innovation to take place. And I think you can follow lots of industries that have had that kind of history. When you get so self-satisfied that you basically say, I don't need to share anymore, I don't want you to really know all the details, then some clever person sneaks into the factory, works on the line, uses the machines, takes the know-how, and goes to another country, and what do you get? A new industry in another place. 
So I think we have the capacity to be really reflective and self-aware. And, uh, and self-awareness is a really important quality. Am I aware of the effect I'm having on the people around me? Am I monitoring the consequence of my actions? Can I reverse the flow of my actions in a positive way because I'm otherwise being negative or exclusive and withholding to myself? And so I think that this capability is present in ways that it's never existed before. And the challenge is, it's kind of weird to be hanging it out there where I said, am I actually listening? Right? That's what about reflection is. Right? Am I really listening or am I actually listening to myself? And so it's easy for us to think we're listening when in fact what we're really doing is enjoying the fruits of our own self to ourselves rather than sharing. So I, I just think there's a, a different way of reflecting. <coughs> so I couldn't agree more. I, as I was saying at the very beginning, you know, the data that we're collecting argues that it's this flow of ideas, I call it, rather than information. But, but that, that seems to be the clock spring that makes things go. And you're right, being defensive while it takes off is a sure way to choke that. I guess um, relevant to the question is I have a concern about Boston. And the, and the concern about Boston is there seem to be three major industries. Um, there's pharma, there's finance, and there's education. And all three of them are in actually really serious trouble. Not immediately. They'll hang out for another 20 or 30 years, no problem. But you read all the time about how pharma is having no new drugs in the chain, in the, in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. they're, they're looking around, <coughs> the investments aren't so good. That's really worrisome when we're talking about that just before the panel. You look at finance. I was just reading in the Wall Street Journal that um, the majority of people in many countries have been investing in mutual funds, all that sort of stuff, and seen negative returns over their lifetime. In other words, you should stick it in the mattress. It's better. That's crazy. That argues that it's an industry that's actually very shaky. And people think, you know, real expert people, including an article by a couple of Nobel Prize winners in economics that argue that the way the mutual fund industry is, is structured has some very fundamental flaws. And then education, which is our business, right? That's creaky too. I mean, we do things that are recognizable from a thousand years ago. It's crazy. <laughs> and yeah, there's all this stuff about. <laughs> it's yeah, 94% real. Is that right? Yeah, that's what 23 and me says. I'm proud. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but, I'll get you a Neanderthal doll. Okay, there we are. If you can find one, I don't know. But, 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 you know, there are things like MOOCs and online, and so far, um, I'm not super impressed. It's great that you can use Khan Economy. It's great that there are some of these things. But I think that the challenges that our society faces, the challenges that Boston faces, have to do with having a greater clock rate of innovation. Not necessarily about technology, but about social organization. We need to change the way we manage ourselves quickly. Often, we need to experiment. We need to see what works. And we have institutions that are, you know, in the case of, of you know, the, the governing institutions, centuries old. Well, the things are different now. In the case of the schools, they're a thousand years old. Things are different now. We need to get out of it. Um, yes, I'm going to want to be a small rant. Uh, <laughs> So I interpret the question a little bit differently, and um, the, the baseline is that uh, nothing is the same. Uh, things aren't the same forever. You know, I've had the opportunity to uh, go to Cairo and you know, be in awe of the pyramids and look around at abject poverty. Right? The same, the same place as the pyramids. Um, and I've had a chance to. Uh, uh, spend time in Istanbul and look at cities uh, that are you know, thousands, thousands of years old that are thriving. And you know, there's no master plan. You know, there's no Detroit future city. There's no Istanbul future city. Um, but what what they did is, which I which I believe we are in the process of doing in Detroit, is creating a value proposition that's rooted 
in the brand of the people and the culture and the assets that exist. And that will sustain forever. Um, and so as, as I, you know, their technologies will come and they go, but I think really <coughs> communicating to people locally and globally the value proposition of the place, um, I think is what allows um, long to go. Yeah, I, I couldn't have said better. Um, thanks for that. Um, no, but look, there's no doubt that in the industries that you highlighted, there are some challenges. And I think the way that um, Boston is to look at it is, I think that there's a natural human tendency to try to attach on to what are your pre-existing strengths and ride it to a point in which um, you've, you've ignored potential new industries that could be growing and with a little nurture, love and care, could grow at an even larger uh, rate. So I think what we're trying to do in Boston now is simply to, of course, not forget those industries, but to diversify as much as we can to potentially mitigate um, what may happen. So uh, what the building that you're in right now is an example of a city using its own resources to try to foster more startups and more innovation in a region that was, by the past administration and continued by the Walsh administration, uh, facilitating and, and, and pumping up a, a new startup economy in the city. Um, we are now doing the same thing in the Dudley Square area in Roxbury. Uh, Boston Public Schools is relocating to a new $120 million building in Roxbury. Mayor Walsh decided to carve out to start at least 5,000 square feet of that uh, to have a startup in there. Uh, I'm sorry, a startup incubator uh, in there. We put an RFP out and we had 17 responses uh, so far of very serious academic, for profit, not for profit organizations that want to foster innovation uh, in, in a new area of the city. So are there certain large challenges with some of the big industries in Boston? Absolutely. But I think it would be a mistake for us to solely focus on how do we save these three industries as much as we can uh, with to the detriment of potentially trying to foster new industries uh, in the city and to, and to diversify our portfolio really uh, in that bit. Thank you. Um, and I guess in that question, that as final comment there is, uh, the other question is there is only so much we can do, right? I mean, about about these things. Um, so uh, we have uh, about twelve minutes for questions uh, before giving final remarks. So it's open to the audience. So uh, a couple of questions going over there. Let us uh, give you a microphone, please. My question it sort of goes to your comments about the city. How do you get the minority populations of a city to become entrepreneurs and how do you nurse them along to where they become meaningful in the environment? It's a great question and uh, I think the, the, the biggest mistake we can make as I'll speak for Boston, I think the biggest mistake we can make as a city is to simply say, let's take the exact formula that happened in this area and plant it in Roxbury. The reality is the demographics are different, the education level is different, um, and the potential business challenges may be different for fostering uh, or starting a company. Uh, so an example of a, of a variation on a theme uh, is Merrimack Valley Sandbox. Uh, it's based in the Merrimack Valley, uh, in Lowell mainly, uh, but they travel all around the area, um, Lawrence, uh, Andover, that, that particular area. And what they do is, yes, they like to invite people in who want to start the next Facebook. But if you want to start a local convenience store across the street and don't know how to build a business model for that, or don't know how to procure items to sell, they will also listen to that idea. And the focus is to tailor an incubator and uh, a real startup advisor that is not just based on high-tech startup, but really looking at the demographics that are involved uh, and the education level that's involved and try to foster those aspirations as well. So when we think of entrepreneurship, when we think of industry, you know, especially in this neighborhood, we really think about high tech, but really there is entrepreneurship that's happening all across the city in all different neighborhoods that we really need to pay equal attention to because, <coughs> I, I don't know the statistic now, but some overwhelming statistic of, of, of Boston industries are small businesses, and the same applies uh, to the United States. So I think there's so much uh, attention paid to high-tech startups, when in reality, I think it's to our detriment not to have a plan where whomever we choose for the Roxbury Incubator really does have a good sense of the community, good sense of the needs, 
good sense of what entrepreneurship education is lacking in creating a curriculum that fosters and attacks that rather than just taking a cookie cutter approach. It's not always perfect, um, but it's something that we need to aspire to do every day. It's another question. Can, can I think. Oh yeah, of course. Um, capital flows. So if you think about where your pension money is, where's your pension money? I know where my pension money is, it's not here. If you look at the flows outside of the things we control in the public sector, like CDFIs, community development finance institutions, or you know CDBG funds and things like that, that's piker money. What's the real money is the money that's actually was in your pocket but it never touched, and it's sitting over in somebody else's bank trying to make a rate of return. If we had a mechanism by which we could flow back or control some of those resources, then the person who's in the community that we want to be an entrepreneur can first get a job to pay for their family. And then eventually, maybe, with, a, with enough space to just basically cover the, the bills, have the, the presence of mind to say, you know, I have that idea, I was a welder, I could do that. But we don't control the capital flows. And until we do that, and I'm not about all of them, just a small amount. Think about how many billions of dollars move out of Boston every day to New York for <coughs> some rate of return that you may or may not be getting. <laughs> Let me just uh, put it in something called uh, City Ventures, which is uh, an entrepreneurial uh, class that involves middle school and high schoolers from Lawrence and Roxbury, all girls schools from places that are all over, including some of the more rich communities. But the point is, is you've got to start young. You know, when they're in sixth grade, they can, they can come up with great plans. They do interesting things. They learn that they can do it. And I think that's something that we need to see a lot more. I think Detroit, this is Kevin for you, I think Detroit is not only the most interesting city in the country right now, but I think it's a symbol of America, what happens to Detroit. I think we all should be watching. And you started your rant, so you kind of got me halfway through my question. Uh, everything I feel for Detroit right now is you are in an absolutely terrible, terrible situation, and you're all pulling together and, and rising above it. And I understand the value proposition, but how did you discover and touch the base of the people, the soul of the people in Detroit to make them feel like they could pull together and come out of this? Because it's awful. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, that's a broad one. So, so, uh, so I didn't touch them. <laughs> uh, you know, in in times uh, of great challenge, um, you know, you can reposition that challenge uh, as a big opportunity. And I think a lot of the stakeholders <coughs> around the table, everyone from the New Economy Initiative to the Mayor's Office um, to to the whole economic development uh, continuum, um, everyone has seen these challenges as really, really big opportunities. And because of the value proposition we've been able to create, we've been able to bring in really you know, class A talent to help us uh, make it to that next level. Um, and so I think that uh, everyone has sort of communicated properly. Uh, we've pull together the support that we need, and it's, it's going to be a long path. Uh, but no one, I, I assure you, that I, that I work with or um, engage with views anything uh, as terrifying or doomsday. Everyone on the ground level recognizes this as the biggest opportunity to come to Detroit in generations. I, I, I agree. I think it's a wonderful place to be. And logically, it's, it's magic. Um, this is a, a, a softball question to follow up on this to Kyle because uh, Kyle and I were in a conference in Russia several weeks ago and he spoke to a bunch of young people and they asked him why uh, Detroit went bankrupt and his answer was because of inequality and everyone stopped and couldn't figure out exactly what Kyle was saying 
But I think it goes back to some of what your question was, and I, I hope you can kind of recreate shortly why that inequality is what led, has led, led Detroit to be bankrupt, and which may be part of the turnaround in, in going forward. And I, I, I just was so taken by that, I'd, I'd like you to kind of do that again, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've reached the, we've reached the B level. No more B talk today. Okay, it's not about bankruptcy. This is about uh, rejuvenation. It's about growth. Whatever. Eric, no more Bs. Um, I, I think it. I think it lends actually more to what Amy was saying, and I, I won't go into the, the piece that I was wrong. But you know, basically, in 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 places where the gap between the haves and the have-nots grow uh, to a certain level, uh, it creates this. Um, this sort of lack of concern for the greater good. Um, and the situation that uh, has taken place over decades of um, just basically lack of trust um, has created stalemates in the community where most communities, you know, things would get so bad that you would come to a level of compromise. Um, but because the lack of trust and the inequality and the combination of those two, uh, people just held their ground for a very, very long time. Um, and that's where we are today. And uh, that, well, that's where we were in the past. We're in a different place now. Um, and as trust has grown um, from the players, like I said, many of the players who are in the room today, many of the players that are on the ground, uh, new administrations that have come in, um, people believe that tomorrow can be different. And that new trust is sort of the currency for how we'll move forward. So. As someone who grew up just outside of Detroit, <coughs> Um, and there are areas outside of Detroit that are like Detroit, actually, today. Um, one of the core problems had to do with the administrative structure. The tax revenue, for instance, was just within the city limits. You had the limit of the city and the limit of the county. And just across that, it was a completely different regulatory and tax structure. And so what that did is that encouraged people who were a little more wealthy to move across the border where it wasn't their problem anymore. And so you've got this uh, fragmentation of society and the alienation of society that comes with that. And one needs to recognize administratively that, you know, we're all in it together at a certain level, right? It needs to be not just right up to eight mile and then you stop. <laughs> it should be, you know, it could be less on the other side of the but they have to have their skin in the game too. So that tax, that tax structure um, that's being referred to <coughs> is no different than a very large company setting up shop next to your mom and pop shop and giving away free ice. It's the same structure, and so it's not a function of you know one administration has a better idea than the other administration. It's a it's a lack of understanding that we're all in it together as a region, and that we're all in it together as a state. Um, so that divisiveness grows and creates gaps and deficits, and uh, it, puts, it puts a strain uh, on the people. So I moved from uh, Denver to Detroit 30 years ago. So it's amazing so many people care about Detroit now. So uh, I just want to ask, since you're also learning about you know, city structures and innovation, uh, we just held a round table with the car companies on innovation teams and we went around talking about best practices. So I'd like to just hear, as you looked around, the one thing you've seen somewhere that you think every city should really try to build into something really spectacular. I speak very quickly. Um, I, Governor um, O'Malley from Maryland was in town yesterday. I had the fortune of, of speaking to him a little bit. Uh, one of the things he pioneered um, is CityStat. CityStat is, uh, long story short, a, a very aggressive quantitative measurement of all factors going on in the city. You meet on a bi-weekly basis, you present your statistics, you're very much out in front of people and people are encouraged to really dive deep into these numbers. Um, one of the things that I learned in the private sector, one of the things we're trying to hold steadfast in the Walsh administration is that you don't know anything until you have a baseline knowledge of basic measurement of your city. 
So if you go into the mayor's office today, you will see a rotating dashboard of all statistics related to the city. Everything from number of books checked out the day before to what percentage of buses arrived on time that morning. Um, what's, what's so important about that is not necessarily just that, but the culture that it creates. We had uh, a secretary who works in veteran services say for the first time in her life she was tracking little hash marks on her desk how many people called veteran services that day because she knew the mayor was watching. <laughs> and she said, I want all the people in my office, I encourage them not to go out more and more because I want to beat my score from the day before. You know, so that's, that's the kind of culture that that kind of behavior and that kind of uh, measurement encourages. And I think if every city and every, and every state and if the country were as rigorous about that as, as I, I learned that pays off and uh, it's really important. I would use something everyone needs really well. So for example, everybody in every town in America needs energy. And there are lots and lots and lots of innovations that are forming and already exist to try to alter our path of energy consumption. Now you might think that what I'm saying is um, extremely expensive and highly unlikely. But I think if we look at places around the world that actually have made a commitment to do that, such as Germany, which in the short run, absolutely, it's complicated right now, but the bottom line is they're on a trajectory toward a low carbon economy. But it's not everything you can do that with. It's got to be something that everybody needs so that you can spread the cost of a huge strategy over a very large number so that you can attract the suppliers and you can phase the plan so that maybe the suppliers aren't there forever. Maybe you're, maybe you're just a temporary location for somebody to be there. But use something everybody needs for short-term development. So I have two really quick things. One's like city staff. Uh, a fellow I know convinced the city of Sao Paulo to change its constitution so that if you are elected to office, you have to write down publicly what are the promises you and an independent commission is set up to evaluate your progress on all those <laughs> promises so that the next time you stand for election, they know how you well tip. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> the other one, maybe a little more controversial, but, but I think it was enormously successful, was Zurich about um, 20 years ago or so. Knew they had an enormous <coughs> population growth coming. And what they did is spend an absurd amount of money building light rail from all the villages into the center of town. And they encourage people to live in the villages rather than in the town. And so today, 60% of the entire region uses the light rail every day. It's almost free for residents. 60%, think about that. And the average commute is 15 minutes. How long is your commute? <laughs> so they invested in Towns, cities, the mixing of different populations, the local political process through billions and billions and billions of dollars. But it really transformed the region and let them absorb uh, this huge population increase. Uh, and in fact, improve the quality of life at the same time. Carlos, can I just add one thing to what Sandy said? Um, uh, another just another brilliant thing Zurich did exactly in that same line, and I haven't seen this yet locally, and we should do this, Dan, is uh, they reprogrammed all the traffic lights to prioritize public transit buses and trains, so, and trolleys. So as they came in, the traffic lights changed the trolleys needs rather than the cars needs, and it's one of the reasons that the public transit commute times are so short. I have time for uh, one more question. Hi, I'm Gilad Rosenzweig, um, smarter in the city, which is an accelerator down in Dudley Square. Um, so my question, I'll try to form this into a question as I speak, but one thing that, <laughs> it's really unique to America, I would say, for the past several hundred years, that we've made regions or cities specific to something. We've labeled our cities. We've labeled LA as the media, as the, um, Entertainment capital, Detroit as the where you make cars, New York as financial, uh, etc. And and now we've, we're kind of we're breaking out of it, or at least we have the opportunity to. Uh, how do we, 
do, do we take advantage of this opportunity now where we have Austin and Boulder and, uh, and Minneapolis <coughs> joining the innovation cities of Boston and San Francisco? Um, and there's you know, probably 100 more that are coming online now, and then we make cars elsewhere, and that different things can happen in Detroit. Um, how do we foster, well, don't like the word foster, but how do we kind of take, up, take advantage of this opportunity that I see now that could go away as soon as this shuffle goes away? It's, it's a very good question, uh, always a challenge. Uh, I think, though, using the Innovation District as an example, um, this whole area didn't happen overnight. What happened was, uh, you know, many people would argue, but I would argue, that the previous administration realized the potential of this area and was ruthless in its branding of this area. They did everything from, you know, talk to every new uh, real estate owner here and old and talk to them about what could happen here if there were a huge cluster of startups, if there were a new culture in the South Boston waterfront. They did everything down to, if you look at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center, uh, on rotation is a graphic that says, welcome to the innovation history. You have to have an all-encompassing strategy that doesn't just include the personal connections, which is really important, but gorilla, like, literally guerrilla marketing. I mean, you really have to repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly get out the word about what you're trying to do, and you need to have that message, and it needs to be in every single speech that you do, whether it's related, uh, directly related to the subject at hand or not. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of other factors that go into it, but if the leadership of that area in a city or in a state isn't constant about the things that are happening, isn't communicating that message, and it isn't unified, it's just not gonna get the same up, up kick. And, you know, it says Innovation District, uh, on your programs up there, you know that that is a result of it, the message constantly being built. And when you when you go out and you you talk to people in this area, a lot of people still don't know what it is. So it's it's getting the message out there, but it's reiterating it um, and and fostering it. And and as you say, if we stop doing it today, I'm sure in 10, 15 years, that whole moniker and this whole this whole thing this is known for may go away. So it's it's not taking uh, anything for granted and continuing to push forward. From Sandy, I really appreciate the fact that you keep suggesting the value of regionalism, that it isn't us as Boston or us as here, but it's here in Boston in this larger area. And the more you can essentially, you know how it is, it's really boring to go alone. It's not fun to drink alone, you don't like to eat alone. So think about it from the standpoint of we're a relatively small population in a pretty big state with an awful lot of potential. But if it, people on the periphery, you know, out on the western edge, could think nothing of Boston, then what have we done? I mean, we, we, we appeal to the outside beyond, but we actually don't even take care of our own within our borders. So I think that thinking about us as a, as a region and a region of innovation, because you need, diversity comes not from, it isn't sameness, right? It really requires everything around it as much variety as possible. 30 seconds uh, each. If anybody wants to uh, leave us with a final word, Uh, okay. uh, really quickly, so um, this weekend I was trying to get out of the uh, garage in City Hall. Uh, I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, and the garage broke. Uh, so out of nowhere came four or five um, security guards and an engineer trying to figure out how to lift this damn door up so I could drive out. Um, and they, they all knew who I was and I was, I was talking with them and one of the guys kind of shyly came up to me and said, hey, you, you guys want ideas, right? Walsh administration wants to hear ideas. Yeah, so, you know, City Hall Plaza is the ugliest, <laughs> the ugliest space in the city, I said, I know. He said, you seen that YouTube video, solar freaking roadways? He said, what if we put those solar panels on City Hall Plaza, and then every event you could just turn on a switch and you could reconfigure the entire City Hall to all these different things. I know it's crazy, but can we do it? And so on Monday morning, I went in to City Hall and went to the Office of New Mechanics that Susan's a member of and says, let's call up the solar freaking roadways people and put some solar panels in City Hall Plaza. Now, we're not sure if it's actually going to happen, but what we want to foster in Boston is a culture where everybody, whether you're a security guard or a billionaire, can come to our administration and suggest 
cool ideas like that and not be afraid to do it. My email is daniel.co, K-O-H, at boston.gov. Email me cool ideas. I don't care how crazy they are. We want to try them out. And when people in, in, in a city see that their government is listening to them, it makes all the difference in the world. I'll leave you with one more thing. We just upgraded our, smart, our, our app for your iPhone. Uh, where you can previously report potholes and everything and, 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 get, uh, and, and get an update back. What we upgraded to now is that if you see a pothole in the city and you take a photo of it, not only will you get a photo back of the filled pothole, but you'll also get a picture of the person who filled that pothole. <laughs> because in our mind it's important for us to, to make it feel like that we're a community and we're one. That's what we're trying to do in Boston um, and we think that that's how, that's how we're really going really to push it forward in our city. Thank you very much.